All right, well, we might um, kick off. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name's Alex Coombs. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome you all to the Monash Advanced Microscopy webinar, and also to introduce our speaker, Associate Professor Kelly Rogers, uh, from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. Uh, Kelly is the head of the Division of Advanced Technology. She also runs both a research lab and the Center for Dynamic Imaging, um, which is somewhat unique in that it's a research-based core facility um, with really top-end equipment for sample preparation, you know, including tissue clearing, for example, um, obviously a lot of you know, high-end imaging kit, uh, and also has a very strong infrastructure for uh, data transport, um, and a lot of expertise in image analysis. So it's, a, it's an amiable position to be in. Um, Associate Professor Rogers uh, not only heads this facility, she's really played a leading role in building the technology and capabilities of this, uh, you know, of the facility, securing multiple large equipment grants from both the ARC LEAF scheme and the ACRF, in addition to funding her own work um, through competitive research grants uh, including an NHMRC ideas grant uh, in the last in the last round. So this integration of technology development and research really puts the Rogers Group in a unique position to derive new biological insight. And this is you know quite nicely illustrated by uh, Kelly's team building a lattice light sheet microscope in 2017, uh, which enabled new insight into the mechanisms of malaria infection in blood cells. And they published a really nice paper on this work in Nature Communications uh, last year. So her research efforts to date have resulted in uh, over 60 publications, many of these in really top tier journals. Um, and in addition to those research efforts, Kelly's helped develop the microscopy and image analysis communities uh, you know, within Australia through organizations like Light, Microsc Light Microscopy Australia and internationally through uh, teaching at microscopy workshops. So today we've got the, the pleasure of hearing uh, Associate Professors Rogers' work in illuminating the life and death of cells with high-speed and multi-dimensional microscopy. Thanks very much, Kelly. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Alex, for that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to telling you a bit about um, the kind of work that we do. Uh, I have a lot to get through. Um, hopefully I can do it uh, in an appropriate time um, and uh, make sure there's plenty of time for questions afterwards in case there are some. Um, but what I wanted to do today was really talk about um, the, our core facility, the, the model that we're working by, um, which, you know, is it's an advanced microscopy facility, as you know, which provides um, researchers with access to um, not just the resources to help them undertake imaging research, um, but also um, a broad range of expertise uh, and uh, I want then to provide some examples of the kinds of projects that we work on uh, and um, and just talk about um, briefly I guess the infrastructure and software that we have in place for data processing and analysis. Um, so I'll just start by telling you um, about WeHi for those of you who don't know WeHi we're based in Melbourne um, it's a medical research institute uh, the main research areas that we work on are um, we look at immune cell function, infectious disease research, uh, cancer. Um, there's some research teams working on development and looking at gene regulation with respect to that in particular. Uh, and um, there's a number of groups who are working on inflammation. So um, this next slide just sort of highlights um, the different types of uh, length scales that we work across. Uh, and you know, from really from the single molecule right up to the whole organism. Uh, and I also show, um, and I'm not sure if I've got, you can see my pointer there. Uh, so I might just activate it, sorry. Um, yeah, so this just sort of shows the, um, the scales across which we're working, um, the different types of uh, samples that we look at. Uh, and, um, and just to highlight uh, that we use different types of microscope platforms in order to address those different, um, to look at the different scales across the biology uh, that we're looking at and that we're interested in. And um, 
also to remind you, um, and many of you already know this, that you know, live cell microscopy really enables us to address um, very complex questions about biological function. Uh, and so this is just an example of the different types of temporal scales that we're working across. Uh, and you know, looking at things like protein-protein interactions, um, uh, cell migration, for example, um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, at least two stories today where we looked at cell death, uh, and um, we also do a lot of work on um, malaria. Uh, and, um, and there are groups here that also look at larger scale tissues, uh, like the group of Jane Visveda, where they look at memory gland development. So I thought I would sort of um, start here by um, just talking about where we started and um, you know, the facility has been up and running now for over 10 years. And in, in the beginning, um, we really were a full cost recovery core facility, which um, meant that we had a limited number of, of staff um, within the facility. Uh, we mostly had a small number of sort of turnkey solutions or commercial um, microscope platforms uh, and some software and um, uh, compute for, for data analysis. Uh, and in the beginning, it was myself and, and Lachlan Whitehead. Um, he was one of the first um, staff that I recruited. And I recruited him uh, to make sure that we could sort of fill that gap of uh, being able to provide researchers with solutions for image analysis. Uh, and this is sort of just to show you um, the pyramid here is really just to demonstrate the kind of work that we were doing and, and perhaps like the proportion of that work, but um, in particular to sort of highlight that at that time, we had very little capacity for research and development um, and that, you know, to implement new methods or workflows. Uh, and um, and, you know, we were able to do some collaborative research. Um, a lot of it was really uh, based around the kind of work that um, Lachlan Whitehead was doing together with teams um, and helping them to develop image analysis scripts. Uh, but a lot of what we were doing was really um, this service delivery. So that was providing researchers with education and training and, you know, facilitating those more sort of routine type experiments and making sure that we were able to provide um, at least uh, the very um, um, basic levels of microscopy, if you like. Um, but then sort of, you know, about, you know, five or six years ago, um, there was some investment made by the Institute uh, to transition this into more of a research-based core facility. And that enabled us to recruit uh, a number of scientists who had a broad range of expertise and they were essentially specialists in different areas and a very multidisciplinary team too. So myself, I'm a biologist by background and Lockie, he is a physicist by background, um, but we then recruited uh, an engineer, uh, Niall Gagan, um, a neuroscientist, uh, Verena Wimmer, whose work I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Uh, and there were a number sort of, there was a mathematician at some point, uh, but really a multidisciplinary team because we wanted to make sure that we could fill some of the gaps that we had um, and make sure that we were able to address any kind of uh, problem that might come our way. And the other thing that we did a little bit differently too was to start um, not just having um, the microscope platforms from uh, commercial companies like Zeiss, Leica and uh, Olympus, but also to introduce um, some more custom built technologies. And Alex already mentioned that uh, we built a lattice light sheet back in 2017, or I should say Niall Gagan did, and uh, together with uh, the help of Lachlan Whitehead. And then Lockie um, was very much um, behind um, developing this virtual desktop infrastructure together with our IT department, uh, which became very useful when uh, we went into lockdown in 2020 because of COVID. Uh, so and this is just to show you then, um, you know, what that changed for us. So that meant that we were able to do a lot more research and development. So in 2017, I was also recruited as a laboratory head uh, and given some startup funds that enabled me to do, to lead um, my own research or for my team to be more involved in leading 
in research. Uh, and we were also became, because of the expertise in the team now and uh, the broad range of different types of applications that we were able to implement, uh, it meant we were able to do a lot more collaborative research. Uh, so this really enhanced the kind of uh, imaging research that we were able to do at WeHi. Um, the service delivery part, you know, was still sort of more or less the same, we were still providing education and training to researchers, especially to students, uh, and we were still able to accommodate, you know, the routine type experiments, but now we were also able to do uh, much more advanced um, microscopy. And, um, and I think in addition, because of this type of um, model, it meant that the scientists working inside of the core uh, had opportunities to be much more creative and innovative and, um, and to be working very closely with a number of different research teams. So there's at least, uh, you know, three or four um, microscopists, senior microscopists in the team now, uh, and they may be working on, you know, maybe four different projects at any one time. Uh, and then now, um, which I'll tell you a bit more about later, is we've established a bioimage analysis core uh, with three scientists, including Lockie, of course, um, who started that here. And, um, and that has also really changed, transformed the way that we're able to analyze data. Um, but I'll take you back um, and, and look, one thing I want to say too before I move on to the next slide is that this has led to, you know, a lot of really fantastic publications um, in, in really uh, very nice publications, some interesting discoveries, and also, um, you know, opportunities for scientists in my team um, to be a lot more engaged in the research, which keeps them, you know, a lot more uh, entertained, I suppose, and, and, and gives them a lot more capacity to be innovative. So I'll start here because this, this really, when I came to WeHi, um, which was sort of back in 2009, um, previously I was a postdoc at um, Institute Pasteur. And I, I should mention too that the model that we sort of put in place um, was really, you know, a, a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of that was already being done at Institute Pasteur. So that was um, really um, one of the reasons why we established something similar because I had seen um, with Spencer Short's facility at Institute Pasteur how it had really transformed the type of imaging research that was possible. And these were some of the early studies um, or early collaborations that I was involved in. And this was with Jake Farm's team. It was led by a PhD student in Jake's team, David Rigler. Uh, and here we started to look at malaria parasite invasion of red blood cells. So if you look at these electron microscopy images here, you can see here is a single merozoite. They are very small, only about one micron in, in uh, in diameter, if you like, uh, and this shows once the merozoite, the parasite, this is the blood stage of malaria, attaches to the membrane of the red blood cell. So you can see it has this tight attachment here. Uh, you get release of uh, these proteins from the apical organelles of the parasite. And when that happens, you get an establishment of this thing called the tight junction, uh, which is marked by this protein RON4. Uh, and then you see the tight junction is formed here around the parasite. The parasite moves into the red blood cell uh, with the membrane tightly wrapped around as it goes. And then once it comes to the rear of the parasite, it eventually closes up. Uh, so uh, most of the data up until then was really derived from uh, these beautiful and elegant electron microscopy experiments. Uh, but Jake's team and others wanted to start looking at this more closely using uh, as a starting point immunofluorescence. Uh, there was a group back in 1975 who had used DIC uh, and time-lapse microscopy and, and gave a very detailed description of this process. Uh, but this um, work here um, by Jake's team, uh, where they traveled up to the University of Technology, uh, the University of Technology in Sydney, um, together with Cynthia Whitchurch and um, uh, who had at that time um, put in place an OMX platform uh, to use 3D SIM. And so these 3D SIM images then allowed them to look a bit more closely at what each of the proteins they were interested in were doing, where they were localized uh, during invasion. And they also introduced this um, other approach uh, where um, the parasite 
infection had been synchronized so they could fix it at different time points and really look at pre-invasion stages uh, this is the nucleus here in blue and then you see this uh, parasite protein rap one in red uh, and in green here is the tight junction and then once the parasite starts moving through the tight junction you can see how there's a, um, a change or a redistribution in in this protein in red here and once it closes up the tight junction closes up behind the parasite then you see the um, this parasite protein is now sort of around uh, the parasite so for the first time they were really able to look at what is happening Happening, what is the order of events uh, during invasion? They had a good understanding using biochemistry what proteins were binding to other proteins, uh, but they didn't know in what order and how they were doing that, what the function of those proteins were. So this really uh, started a, a new way of being able to look at this process more closely. So <laughs> There's my arrows. Uh, so in the next um, uh, slide, um, it, this shows some work that we then undertook together with Alan Kalman's team. Uh, and so this was looking at, uh, this This is just a bright field time lapse, uh, looking at calcium flux during invasion, which was identified uh, by the, the groups, by Brendan Crabb's team at um, the Burnett Institute. Uh, so they identified this, um, this flux of calcium that occurs uh, right before invasion. Uh, and then you can see the, the rainbow color scale on there showing that there are very high calcium concentrations in this micro domain here at the site of invasion in red. Uh, and then this sort of, um, this wave of calcium across the cell. So Alan's team uh, were very interested in some of these proteins that they knew were interacting and they wanted to look at, at what point in the invasion process uh, did these proteins become important? And they identified that this complex uh, between uh, the RIPA protein, the CYRPA, and the RH5 protein, uh, when these three proteins released by different apical organelles uh, at different times uh, during invasion would come together and then bind to the basogen, which is a receptor on the red blood cell membrane, and they were able to identify and understand a little bit further uh, what the function of these proteins were. And without this particular complex uh, invasion was completely inhibited. Uh, but what they identified was that the calcium flux uh, was still able to take place uh, despite blocking this process, but invasion um, was not able to, to uh, the invasion process was, was very much dependent on this calcium flux. So, um, during that work, uh, we attempted to set up um, some live imaging using confocal, and this was with the resonance scanning confocal, the Leica SB8 uh, that we have. Uh, and here we're able to do sort of fast uh, Z stacks in time and look at these parasites as they're invading. But as you can see that sort of when you turn this image on its side, you can see that the uh, resolution in the axial direction was, was very poor. Uh, and that was because we weren't able to sample high enough um, due to phototoxicity and just constraints with respect to time. Uh, so just to highlight that the parasite invasion um, is a difficult process to image uh, because the parasites are quite sensitive to light. They're also very small and the process of invasion is very, very fast. Uh, so it, this sort of became, uh, you know, very, very challenging for us. Uh, we were still able to get some very interesting information. So you can see here, this is the maximum intensity projection of that data. Uh, and then you can see the single slice here, which shows very nice the parasite uh, invading uh, into the red blood cell. Um, but, you know, we really, at that point, realized that it was a very challenging process to image, and we really wanted, uh, needed a more spatial temporal resolution. <clears throat> So, um, you know, but at that time, there were still some questions that we weren't able to uh, answer um, with the techniques that we had, such as, you know, really, how is the parasitophorus vacuole being formed? Um, this was controversial at the time, uh, even though EM data from the early days was showing that this was likely to be largely due to the erythrocyte membrane. Other data had uh, disputed this as um, since they had identified that the parasite apical organelle, the rock trees, uh, was um, full of this sort of lipid um, 
and, and proteins that was being ejected during invasion. So there were some thoughts that this lipid being injected by the parasite was contributing to the formation of the vacuole. So that was one of the important questions that we really wanted to answer. Um, and the other things that we became interested in were things like what kind of biophysical changes might be occurring in the host red blood cell membrane during invasion and what sort of cytoskeletal remodeling is taking place. Uh, and, and really, you know, are we able to uh, understand uh, what the mechanism is for PVM sealing? And really the only way to do this was to use imaging and to use time-lapse microscopy. So this presented a, an important conundrum for us. Uh, so when this paper came out um, by Eric Betzig's team in 2014, uh, describing the lattice light sheet microscope, um, we got quite excited. Uh, we realized up until that point, we were very interested in light sheet microscopy, but we had no, uh, we, we were aware that most of the instruments at that time uh, were for looking at bigger specimens uh, and they didn't have the resolution that we needed to be able to look at parasite invasion of red blood cells. Uh, just to remind you, the parasites are very small, one to two microns in diameter, and the red blood cells are also extremely small, only about seven microns in diameter. So the existing systems at that time were not able to address this question, but the lattice light sheet really changed all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the reason why earlier implementations of light sheet were not able to achieve the resolution was because of the, the, the the Gaussian beam was being used in, in, in light sheet microscopes. Uh, and this, um, particularly as this um, particular beam propagates, uh, as, as the length of the beam increases, then the thickness um, of the beam also increases. Uh, and so to be able to achieve uh, with a Gaussian beam, uh, the kind of resolution that we needed, uh, we would have to have a very high magnification, very high numerical aperture. And this would mean that we'd have a very small field of view. Uh, but this all changed with lattice light sheet. And uh, when Eric Betzik's team introduced the Bessel beam, which is more a non-diffractive type of beam that has a very thin profile in, in comparison and has a very good axial resolution over the distances that we need to, to be able to image this kind of process. So in the beginning, the motivation for us to have lattice light sheet was really to be able to address these outstanding questions that we had um, with respect to malaria parasite invasion. Uh, and um, at that time, we got into contact with Eric Betzig when the paper came out. It was also the same year that he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and, um, and we asked him, him, you know, how could we get uh, this kind of instrument at WEHI, um, you know, would he be able to assist us with that? And, and he replied the very next day to say that, um, that he was willing to help us, uh, that there were three ways that he could, that um, we could get access to this technology. The first was to go to the AIC, the Advanced Imaging Centre at Genalia. The second was to purchase the instrument from 3i or the third was to build it ourselves. And at that time, given that it was really just Lockie and myself in the facility, building it ourselves was, was not something that was going to be, uh, you know, an easy uh, feat to achieve. So um, round about that time, Kate MacArthur, who was in Ben Kyle's team, was very interested in looking at mitochondrial DNA release as in an earlier paper they had published, they had found that mitochondrial DNA would uh, stimulate uh, the C gas pathway, a sting pathway, which would lead to um, activation of inflammatory pathways. And she came to me uh, and, and wanted to be able to image this process using the microscopes that we had. Um, but we quickly realized that we didn't have the signal to noise ratio that we needed. And it was really too phototoxic, even though it was uh, she was interested in intrinsic apoptosis. Uh, it was very difficult for us to image that process uh, with the, um, and, and admittedly we had an SBA uh, resonance scanning confocal, which is what we attempted to do it with. Um, but we one of the things that Eric mentioned to us uh, at that time was that the other possibility was to travel to, uh, to um, Genalia, um, which is just outside of Washington, uh, and to do the experiments there. And um, so that 
was a fantastic opportunity and um, and Kate at that point began to have discussions with uh, the team there, with Leong and also with John Heddleston uh, to set up those experiments. And both Lockie and myself uh, traveled together with Kate on several occasions to undertake those experiments. So using Lattice Light Sheet, um, indeed it was possible with the, with the great signal to noise ratio you have. And, and also just to mention that this instrument allows you to image wholesale volumes very, very quickly in a very gentle way. And you can see here that um, when she activated apoptosis, this intrinsic apoptotic pathway, uh, you can see these little uh, blobs of green popping out of these mitochondria. The mitochondria fragment during apoptosis, they round up like little donuts. Uh, and then you get this, uh, these uh, mitochondrial DNA shown in green here popping out. So with some optimization of the construct she was using, using very bright fluorescent proteins uh, targeted to the outer mitochondrial membrane to TOM20 and also to uh, TFAM uh, to highlight the mitochondrial DNA, um, they were able to uh, see that this mitochondrial DNA was popping out. So this was a really a remarkable um, finding. And then she took it a step further and Kate developed these constructs where she was able to look at back and backs foci, foci uh, which accumulate on the outer mitochondrial membrane during apoptosis. Uh, and what she could see here was that during apoptosis, you get these uh, redistribution, for example, of the backs from the cyto cytoplasm to the outer mitochondrial membrane where it formed these foci. Uh, and then what you could see here was that the mitochondrial DNA was basically popping out uh, through the area where those foci were lo located. But as you know, that lattice light sheet is a diffraction limited uh, microscopy technique. Uh, and so what it appeared to us at that time was just these little blobs um, on the outer mitochondrial membrane. And you could just see the blob of uh, mitochondrial DNA as well. So we took it a step further. And on one of those trips uh, to Genalia, uh, we also used in parallel their live 3D SIM platform, which was virtually next door to where the lattice light sheet microscope was um, based. So while Kate was undertaking experiments on the lattice light sheet, in parallel, I was undertaking uh, some of the experiments on the 3D SIM platform. We, we later got our own um, 3D SIM platform here at WeHi, and what Kate was able to show was that, in fact, um, the backs and the back were forming these macropores on the outer mitochondrial membrane, and it was through these macropores, these openings that you can see here, you see in blue the ring, uh, in red is the TOM20 um, marking the outer mitochondrial membrane, and then you see that the mitochondrial DNA in green is popping out through these little apertures that have been formed. So that was really like, you know, a very important discovery. And I'm not going to go into more detail here, um, but uh, with Lachlan Whitehead's help, they did a lot of quantitative analysis to really look at the various kinetic properties of apoptosis uh, using various markers. And, and, um, and that work um, was published in Science back in 2018. So um, we also... Um, We've also looked at other forms of cell death, uh, such as necroptosis. So um, here on the left here is another, you know, this work was done in collaboration with uh, James Murphy and uh, Edwin Hawkins Labs, uh, with together with, um, with uh, Andre Sampson, who was leading this work. Uh, and he worked very closely with Niall um, to look at using our home-built lattice light sheet to look at necroptosis. Uh, and here, for example, they looked at annexin in yellow. Um, the membrane is marked in magenta. Uh, and then using this uh, nuclear uh, marker in blue. And, and so um, MLKL, um, which is what they were interested in and what they were studying at that time, is a pseudokinase, which is known to be involved in necroptosis. Uh, and uh, this is necroptosis is, is a, another form of cell death, but it's different to apoptosis in that it's a, a lytic form of cell death. Uh, and this tends to be more damaging than apoptosis because it's a very sort of messy form of cell death. And they used a cocktail of drugs um, which inhibit the intrinsic apoptotic pathway, which Kate was looking at, uh, and, and this triggered cell death, but instead leads to necroptosis. And they could see that during this process, and having this beautiful um, 
you know, four dimensional data um, that they could see that there was this process of membrane damage occurring. So the cells expand, they sort of blow up like balloons and then eventually uh, the uh, plasma membrane ruptures. Uh, and um, they noticed that where this rupturing was occurring, there were these sort of bright annexin blobs uh, forming uh, at the site um, of where it was sort of blowing open. And they also noted that often these sort of blobs were occurring uh, in sites that were um, nearby to uh, tight junctions between two cells. Um, and they performed an analysis um, and, and showed in addition quantitatively that um, what often occurred was that once one cell dies, other cells in very close proximity would also die. Uh, and then using um, a toolkit of um, various uh, markers uh, and now looking, and, and I should mention that um, that MLKL um, sort of as a pseudokinase in involved in this process, what they had found was that it wasn't simple to tag this particular protein. When you did that, it's, it uh, tends to perturb the function of the protein. So they weren't able to look at this using live imaging and they're yet to have a sort of developed a way to do that. But instead, um, based on what they understood from the temporal data, that they'd got from the latter slide sheet. They then went to the 3D SIM platform, looked at fixed cells using immunofluorescence assays and um, a bunch of different um, markers. And also were able to see that MLKL uh, similarly sort of formed these hotspots um, between the junctions of cells. Uh, and uh, so in blue, you've got the wheat germagglutinin just marking the cell membrane, uh, and then these hotspots forming in yellow. Uh, and so what they found then was that, um, that, uh, that the accumulation of the activated form of MLKL. So in, I should mention that in magenta is sort of apparently the non-activated form, but the activated form was accumulating at these junctions and then that was contributing to cell death. So um, this shows very nicely, um, you know, the importance of being able to use different microscopy techniques to address different questions. So I'm going to switch back now to our studies on malaria. So um, in 2017, I think I already mentioned, after we had been to Genalia several times, um, we managed to build a lattice light sheet microscope ourselves. Not me, of course. That was uh, really um, a credit all credit goes to Niall Gagan, who was responsible for that. Um, we had recruited Niall Gagan as a postdoc uh, not too long after he had completed his PhD and at the University of Glasgow, and he was a biomedical engineer by background. And so Niall came in and his first task was to build the lattice light sheet. He did that uh, together with the help of Lachlan Whitehead, who'd had the opportunity to learn how to build it at, um, at Genalia. Uh, and, um, and one of the first experiments uh, you just saw here, which was passed, so I'll just go back to it, um, was to look at, uh, of course, parasite invasion of red blood cells, which was the main motivation for us wanting to build a lattice light sheet in the beginning. Uh, and you see very beautifully how these parasites invaded red blood cells. So you see all of the details in four dimension uh, with very high time resolution. And, um, you know, considering again, this is a diffraction limited technique, but despite that, we could really see uh, all the, the stages of invasion. And up until then, uh, we hadn't been able to really visualize all stages of invasion using microscopy because, you know, for example, with differential interference um, contrast, we could see uh, what was happening up until uh, the, in the pre-invasion stages up to, until the internalization of the parasite, but we weren't able to see very clearly how the Parasitophorus vecca was formed and how it was sealed. And then um, just to highlight again, the advantage of this approach, uh, now if we take a slice through um, these red blood cells, you can see very nicely um, these parasites that are in yellow as they come in and uh, how the red blood cell membrane is getting wrapped around the parasite during that process. So we we're very excited because we thought we can address that question now um, with respect to what is forming the Parasitophorus vacuole membrane. And what you can see there is that it really is uh, formed largely by the erythrocyte membrane. So as the parasite um, goes in, it drives its way in, it's just becoming wrapped by the erythrocyte membrane. And this is another example here. So in blue, you see the mat mature schizon, uh, and then it ruptures. This is 
what is known as ingress, uh, and then the parasite is um, invading um, here. You see deformations on the membrane, which are characteristic of the process, and then you see internalization happening, and then followed by sealing of the PVM. So this has given us a way now to be able to start to interrogate those particular processes. And we also took it a step further and, and were able to um, quantitatively analyze the kinetics of invasion. And here we just simply used uh, Amaris, um, but we're working on an approach uh, to automate that more than what we were able to do so. Um, but nevertheless, we were able to quantify the dynamics of that process uh, in, in cases where invasion proceeded normally and in cases where we were using an inhibitor. And to come back to the question regarding, um, you know, what is largely contributing to the uh, parasitophilus effect on membrane here, around the time when we were looking at this, uh, this paper was published. Lockie found this paper, um, which described Lyme seg, and this is essentially a, a surface, a 3D surface reconstruction algorithm. And by drawing these ROIs here on the cell, uh, it then um, creates this surface around the cell. Uh, and then they, uh, him and Niall adapted this to red blood cells, um, which enabled them to look at things like uh, the surface area of red blood cells uh, and also the surface area of uh, the parasitophilus vectoral membrane. Just this would enable to look then at really um, what is largely um, contributing to that vacuole membrane. So this data here just shows how there was a loss of membrane surface area during an invasion, which um, sort of again um, uh, demonstrates that it is largely the erythrocyte membrane contributing to that process. Uh, so in blue is the erythrocyte surface area. On these bar graphs in orange is the PVM uh, surface area. Uh, and then when you see green, that's when sometimes you get two parasites that are invading. Uh, but the difference um, in the drop in surface area was really made up by the surface area of the vacuole, which further kind of um, it gave us even more evidence that this is what was happening. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail around that, um, but uh, there, there are still proteins and lipids being um, ejected by the parasite during invasion, and we're still trying to understand what role those lipids and, and proteins have. Uh, and we suspect that they are contributing to um, a change in the composition of the parasite Tophorus vacuole membrane. Uh, and so we've also looked at things like biophysical changes in the membrane. Uh, and, um, and that work was uh, published last year um, and, and is ongoing. And um, Alex mentioned that um, we were successful with a grant last year through an ideas grant through NHMRC. So we're continuing to interrogate some of those processes. Uh, and um, and then um, I just wanted to mention uh, and that we also um, began working on the Zeiss lattice light sheet uh, a couple of years back now, um, looking at um, parasite invasion and just to highlight that a big advantage of this commercial platform, uh, apart from the fact that it looks uh, it's a lot simpler to use. Uh, so. Um, it's an inverted, it's based on an inverted uh, format, so you can use many different types of dishes in there. Uh, when we had the home built system, we were working with a five millimeter cover slip, um, which and the mounting was complicated. Uh, it's also an open top system, so we couldn't really do very long term imaging. But with this system now, we can look at many different types of samples. Uh, it's a closed system uh, and um, we can do very long term imaging if we want to. And the other big advantage is that um, it's a much bigger field of view. Um, the trade off is simply is, of course, that the resolution is slightly lower, but it's still uh, enough for us to um, image those events. Uh, with a lot of detail. But now um, where we were able to only get a, a smaller number of invasion events e each time we ran an experiment, now we can get lots of invasion events when we're uh, undertaking these kind of experiments. So I'm going to um, uh, switch over to a different type of light sheet microscopy because I, I've just gone through sort of research that was being led by my team um, in close collaboration with Alan Kalman's team. And now I'm going to talk about some other collaborative research that we've been engaged in. Uh, so one of the investments we made was also in uh, light sheet microscopy. So this was to be able to look at larger uh, specimens and, and also organs, which you can see here. So here you see 
rotating the lymph nodes. Uh, they've been cleared with C3D. Um, and this is work that, um, you know, the, the optimization of this process was really undertaken by Verena Wimmer, who's a senior scientist in, in my team. And um, this again, just really highlights the importance of having um, scientists um, with, you know, that are specialists in different areas and have a lot of expertise in different areas of microscopy to be able to really get these um, methods uh, up and, and, and running. So here they took these lymph nodes um, that are cleared, they put them on the lychee platform, were able to scan whole volumes uh, of these lymph nodes and look at the localization of things like B cells and T cells. And this was in collaboration with Joanna groom's team uh, and um and then using a image analysis um uh, algorithm that was developed by uh thomas budier uh, they were able then to show um, where these cells were localized and how the localization of these cells would change uh, after viral infection for example uh, and then eventually this led them to um, understanding that things like the cxcr3 ligands uh, that are expressed by spatially distinct um, dendritic and also um, stromal cell subsets in, in various areas of the lymph node niche, niche areas um, that would direct uh, differentiation of T cells, which would either occur into stem cells in the center of the lymph nodes or alternatively in the periphery of these uh, peripheral areas of these lymph nodes. Uh, so this um, work was uh, published last year. So I'm just going to go through some um, various applications that uh, and, 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 and um, research projects that we we're involved in. Um, this one, many of you at Monash will probably be familiar with, um, but I wanted to highlight it because it's, it's really um, a beautiful study that was led by Danny Ratnayaki uh, in Peter Curry's lab. Uh, this is led by the Curry lab. And um, we undertook some experiments together with them. Uh, firstly, this shows here on the left, um, this is done in zebrafish, uh, where they were interested to see um, what this macrophage population were doing immediately after uh, inducing injury in, in the uh, zebrafish, uh, in the muscle of the zebrafish here. Uh, and uh, so we used the multi-photon platform to induce the injury with the multi-photon laser. And again, this is work that Verena Wimmer um, she was working closely together with Danny um, on these experiments. They induced the injury. You then see these macrophage, um, macrophage cells coming into the injured site. Um, and so there was this analysis on the trajectory of the macrophage cells. Uh, and then um, they took it a step further and they put this um, uh, this system, the zebrafish onto the light sheet platform that we have, so they could look at then the whole organism to understand um, where these macrophages were coming from. And what they found was that this particular population of macrophages that were going into the wound site were really um, those that were very nearby to where the uh, tissue was injured uh, and they were um, dwelling there for long periods of time. And then they took it over to the airy scan confocal that we have uh, and looked more closely with very high resolution at what was actually happening there. And so what you see is these uh, macrophages here that have these sort of long extensions. We're interacting very closely uh, with these muscle stem cells. Um, these muscle stem cells uh, tend to be normally quite quiescent in the muscle, but um, here they, what they saw was that when these macrophage, this macrophage population interacted closely with these cells, it stimulated them to divide. Um, and from there, um, this, is, this is a very beautiful study actually, from there they isolated that particular um, subset of macrophages, uh, undertook single cell um, RNA sequencing, and eventually this led to identifying a factor that was being secreted by macrophages that was stimulating those cells to divide. And even more exciting was then they took that into the mouse uh, and, and demonstrated that, that the same uh, process was occurring. So it's a beautiful study. Um, and then I wanted to highlight this work um, that we undertook together with um, Jean Bethelet and Delphine Marino uh, from uh, the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute. Again, this is work that um, Verena was involved in, and this is where they used, um, and, and it was also um, 
uh, done with John Hollanders, uh, who had been using this Lego system. So this is an optical barcoding system, uh, and they were interested in using this system to look at metastatic heterogeneity. Uh, and the Lego um, system used here was enabling them to see 31 different barcoded clones. Uh, so individual cells um, were using these Lego viruses uh, they, uh, that they would put onto these cells and then these cells would express uh, different combinations of these fluorescent proteins here. So there were five in total and this led to then um, being able to identify 31 different clones. And from that work, um, it meant that they could start to track individual clones, uh, look at heterogeneous populations of, of tumor cells in different organs. Um, and with this cell tracking strategy, uh, they could start to compare metastatic seeding, um, you know, for example, between the lungs and between the liver. So in the lungs, the, um, these metastases tend to be a lot more polychromatic. In the liver, they're a lot more monochromatic. Uh, and then they found by also combining this with some single cell sequencing uh, and, and other techniques um, like flow cytometry, uh, that um, how these um, particular clones would metastasize to various organs was very much dependent on the, um, the tissue microenvironment where they metastasized to. So um, this work was, was really very nice work as well. Now, um, one of the big challenges um, for us, in particular with the light sheet microscopy, uh, a lot of the work that I just showed you has either been undertaken on the lattice light sheet um, or on the light sheet microscope from Zeiss, the Z1. Uh, and the biggest challenge for us has really been, um, you know, handling the data and the analysis of the data. Uh, so um, this, um, this is work that's been undertaken by Pradeep Rajesika and Lachlan Whitehead, uh, showing that, you know, now instead of, um, you know, in producing 100 gigabytes of data that um, some teams tend to do using confocal with very long overnight um, confocal imaging. Uh, now we're sort of, you know, generating terabytes of data um, and many, many terabytes of data, depending on the type of experiment that it is. So how, how to um, handle this? And so these are some of the analysis pipelines that have been uh, developed by uh, the image analysts in our team. There are three. Um, and what they're working towards is creating more streamlined ways to um, transfer the data from the system where it's generated to the server where it's stored, uh, and then being able to um, make that data in, in a more sort of palatable form where it can be annotated. Uh, so for example, they've come up with ways to auto automate creating ROIs on the areas of interest. Uh, so just taking that, for example, from a maximum intensity projection, um, and then um, with that cropped area, then undertaking other things like, so for the lattice light sheet, there's a number of um, processing steps that we need to do uh, to complete that data. So we have to de-skew the data. Uh, and then in some cases, we also deconvolve the data. Um, but this, this really has been um, a real big challenge for us. A lot of work has gone into um, how to, to improve the way we handle the data. Uh, and we, use a range of different software packages. So once the data is in a cropped form, uh, and we might crop in both space and in time, um, we can then feed this data into software packages like Amaris, um, which the biologists like to use, uh, and we can start to do more quantitative analysis on that, on that data. Um, and then um, just to highlight that uh, Pradeep and uh, Lockie um, got some funding from CZI recently, which is allowing them now to um, put this sort of streamlined workflow into Napari, uh, into a Napari uh, plugin. Uh, so that's sort of a work in progress. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, in particular, we're, they're using this approach for data that's coming off the Zeiss lattice light sheet, uh, then please reach out to either Pradeep or Lockie. And then, um, and then just to highlight again, um, you know, there's, we've invested a bit in um, data infrastructure and, man and management of that data. Uh, so the data can either be stored locally on the hard drive where it's generated, but then we try to get it to the network 
to, to the server to be stored as soon as possible uh, because we get this backlog of data otherwise, which means that the next users can't get on and, and acquire their data. Um, but this is um, one of the things that Lockheed did um, in 2019 or even earlier than started doing earlier than that was to start building these um, remote desktop infrastructure. So we have, you know, many, many virtual machines now which can be booked by the users uh, and they can and um, and they have a very high level of compute, which enables the biologists to analyze their data much more effectively than their own desktop machines. Uh, so a lot of the analysis uh, and processing and analysis now is done remotely. Uh, and so there's all, also some of the processing um, is done and some of the analysis is done on uh, high performance computing. Uh, and, um, and just to mention that um, we recently established uh, this bioimage analysis core, uh, which has three dedicated image analysts, um, including Lachlan, um, uh, Pradeep, and, and now Marjan, who recently joined the team. Uh, so there's a lot of work going into that. And I'm, I'm conscious of the time, um, so I will um, try to sort of um, uh, fly through the next parts. Um, now I'm going to sort of talk about, um, highlight some of the areas that are currently in development um, and where we're sort of, I guess, sort of starting to go next. And, um, and this was um, equipment that was funded through the ACRF. Um, and, um, and this is um, called multiplex iron beam imaging. So this particular um, system that we installed um, uh, in 2020, um, was allows you to look at up to 40 different biomarkers inside of tissue. Uh, it's based on um, iron beam, uh, a focused iron beam, and also mass spectrometry. And uh, using these antibodies that are conjugated to uh, stable metal isotopes. Uh, so Marilia Sasselin Labar is the person to contact if you're interested in doing that. Her lab has really been leading the way with this um, technology. Um, they have now um, imaged a number of different types of tissues. Uh, Claire Marceau is a postdoc in her lab uh, and, um, and they're looking at um, you know, more than 30 biomarkers inside of FFPE tissue now. Uh, and this is very similar to some of you might be familiar with the um, imaging mass um, uh, imaging mass uh, spectrometry system um, the Hyperion system that um, links in up to the CYTOF instrument. Um, and the advantage of the MIBI scope, um, which it is called, is that it allows you to get subcellular resolution. Uh, so this helps a lot with being able to identify and segment out single cells. Um, and one of the big advantages of having more markers, um, anyone doing flow cytometry and looking at immune cells, for example, will know that this then allows them to profile the different immune cell subsets that can exist in tissues. So Mary Lias's team are looking at um, things such as lung cancer and looking at what's happening in the uh, microenvironment in the tissue uh, around where these tumors are and, and, and characterizing um, the different types of proteins that are being expressed there different genes that are expressed there. And so um, this is an example of an image that has been captured on the MIBI scope. Uh, this is only with about six different um, markers being shown, um, but there's also software now and a number of um, work has gone into uh, segmenting this tissue, uh, being able to put different markers on there and then starting to do various types of analysis. Uh, they also work very closely with the bioinformatics department here at WEHI uh, to really start to um, understand the complexity of these kinds of images. So you can imagine as soon as you start getting about 40 different biomarkers in there, it does become very complicated to analyze that data. Uh, so that work is ongoing and for anyone who may have been able to see uh, this morning the spatial um, technology symposium that's going on at WEHI would have seen a talk that was given by Marilius about this uh, about this technology. So um, the other emerging area of course is us uh, well that is um, incorporates that is spatial omics uh, and um, as many of you will know that um, a lot of what we've been doing up to now, and this is very much work that's been done inside of our genomics platform, is um, 
you know, back in 2007, method of the year um, by Nature Methods was looking at um, bulk uh, RNA-seq, um, looking at transcriptomic profile in populations of cells. Uh, then, um, you know, in sort of around uh, 2016, uh, people started to use uh, single cell RNA-seq. I talked about that earlier. Um, it, how it was used by um, P Peter Curry's team at Monash. Uh, and then they started to understand the transcriptomic profile of individual cells. The next sort of step really then is um, taking that uh, into uh, being able to identify single cell um, transcriptomics in, in tissue and, and looking at that spatially. Uh, so this was first sort of done using spatial transcriptomics where the resolution um, was sort of around, I think it's about 50 microns. So it allows you to look at tissue areas, but not um, individual cells. And now that's sort of been taken a step further. Uh, and um, there's a number of technologies emerging right now, um, especially those that have been presented today that are looking at um, single cells and then subcellular resolution inside of tissue. Um, in the case of this technology here, um, there's a number of commercial platforms uh, that um, can do this, uh, there you may have to choose or select um, the RNA uh, transcripts that you want to image, whereas the technique that I mentioned before that doesn't quite have subcellular resolution, uh, there it's a much more unbiased way of looking at the transcriptome. Um, but the, nevertheless, this is a very exciting area. Uh, and we published a, uh, a review. This was led by um, Sabrina Lewis, who's a PhD student in my lab, who's supervised by Verena Wimmer, um, myself, also Delphine Marino and Charlene Nyack. Uh, and uh, Sabrina wrote this beautiful review that was published in Nature Methods last year. So if anyone wants to learn more about these technologies, um, please go to that paper and have a look. Um, it's a very comprehensive review. And Sabrina uh, is, uh, is working on an area looking at uh, multiplex RNA imaging inside of tissue. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, you can reach out to either her or to Raymond Yip, who are currently working on that. Now, this is my last slide, um, uh, just to mention quickly sort of what ongoing work uh, and what our future directions are. And, um, you know, I, I think I also just wanted to sum up and say that, you know, having a broad range of instrumentation uh, has um, really given us a lot of flexibility to image across different length scales and, and look at different degrees of resolution and also um, different temporal scales. Um, but um, what has been really important for us uh, in investing in that type of instrumentation is to have a scientist who's a specialist in that area who really drives the collaborations and who really works very closely with research teams. And that has been extremely beneficial uh, and it creates a very stimulating environment inside of the core facility. Um, you know, I just wanna mention quickly too that what's been very important is this top-down change in, in the culture and that our core facility staff now are, are not seen as service providers, but rather, um, scientists with a high level of expertise who can collaborate very closely with research teams where they can make very important contributions to that research. Uh, and so we're also continuing to develop and, and apply customized analysis pipelines. I mentioned the bioimage analysis core. Um, where Sabrina, who's a PhD student in the lab, is um, looking at 3D multiplex imaging of RNA fish in tissue. Um, we have another PhD student, David Bryan, who's working on microfluidics so that we can start to scale up experimental throughput. Uh, and, you know, um, there's other things going on like AI-based automated microscopy workflows. Uh, and just one of the areas that we're starting to focus more on now, um, because we have the bandwidth to do so, is coming up with more effective data management tools and, and also implementing better processes for quality control. So um, thank you very much um, uh, for your attention. I'm sorry, uh, I've probably run out of time, but I'm very happy to take questions. I just wanna highlight all the people who have been involved in this work, in my team in particular, Niall, Cindy, uh, Verena Wimmer, Michael Marginoski, uh, Lachlan Whitehead, Pradeep, Raymond, Sabrina, there's, there's many there, um, they've been, 
really, really important in these in this collaborative research. Um, our collaborators who are listed here, in particular, Alan Kalman, Joanna Groom, Edwin Hawkins, and, and I just want to highlight Phil Hodgkin, who is the chair of our imaging leadership team. Thank you for your attention and very happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, what a what an outstanding, you know, range of methods and, you know, just such an interesting and effective model for, um, you know, for a core facility. I think that you've really, you know, highlighted the benefits of, of having, you know, the diverse skill set in terms of, you know, imaging expertise, in terms of engineering analysis and all of that amazing data infrastructure. Um, we, we do have time for questions. If anybody needs to go, you're obviously welcome to do so and thank you for attending. Um, but I'm happy to hang around and have a chat. So let's do that. Um, we'll take the first question from the chat here, um, uh, which says, thanks for the inspiring talk. In your experience, how deep can the Zeiss um, lattice image from the cover slip? And this is a, a, an area of interest for me as well. Uh, no. <laughs> He would be able to answer this question better than I, I can because he um, is um, the one who's directly involved in these experiments uh, and working closely with um, various research teams. But I think it has a, a lot to do with the length of the light sheet. So um, you can go uh, deeper with a longer light sheet, but the trade off, I think, is, is a slightly lower um, axial resolution. But in any case, um, you won't get deeper than what you can get with a confocal. So um, with confocal already, as you start to get sort of, I don't know, I'm afraid to say here, but maybe more than 50 microns in, you start to see more and more sort of light scatter. Um, remembering that these are not cleared samples, of course, because we're looking at live samples. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I think that they've been able to look at organoids, um, anything sort of bigger than that, um, it might start to become more difficult. Thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. I guess it's, um, you know, one of the challenges with the, with the, I guess, standard lattice setup is that it's, it's not easy to get other samples on there. So one of the great things about the new uh, inverted system is that it opens it up to, you know, more diverse sample types, including potentially tissues, um, which that type of uh, high speed volumetric imaging could have a really big impact on. Um, so that, that was actually my first question as well. Uh, thanks for the audience for, for asking that. Um, the other thing I was interested in was the um, virtual desktop infrastructure. Um, I guess, you know, you know, not getting too technical, but what kind of um, analysis programs are people using there? And is there an issue with lag between like, let's say you're working from home or, you know, working from your, um, PC on your on your on in your office. Um, how does that go? Uh, look, um, not really. There sometimes there is some lag, but that might be more to do with your own network. Um, so uh, we at a certain step we were doing funny things like you know proving that we could use that remote desktop infrastructure from very you know sort of strange places so Niall I think he um, did it on a plane once yeah. um, and myself I did it in a in a port we were on a boat um, and we just did funny silly things like that um, so there will be some lag um, if your network if you don't have a good bandwidth on your own network um, but in general uh, it's you know the compute uh, we keep that updated. Um, we've got very good GPU and uh, CPU, depending on what you're using. Uh, in terms of the the software, um, we're using uh, a lot of we're using Amaris a lot, and that just stems from the fact that people are most familiar with that program. Um, you know, Fiji ImageJ um, using Halo for the multiplex imaging data. Um, they, I think Loki and is all and Pradeep are also using QPath, um, which is an open source sort of version of the. Uh, it does similar things to what the Halo software can do. Um, we have a Revis, um, but we haven't really got into using that um, in a big way, uh, largely because we don't really necessarily. Uh, aren't as comfortable with that as what we are with the with Amaris, but um, we're certainly learning more about that 
I'm trying to think what other, they're the main, I would say they're the main software packages. Um, Pradeep and Loki are now sort of venturing into looking at Napari and um, creating plugins for that. Uh, and I think they're using Python, but you know, that would be more the bioimage analysis team who are doing sort of more advanced um, type analyses there. Yeah, fantastic. So I think you knocked off a few questions in the chat there as well, um, which were, you know, alternative software aside from Amaris. Um, some people uh, reporting that they find their data shrinks going into Amaris, which sounds like a good thing to me. Uh, but I guess it implies loss of information and um, and a question about Arevis as well, which you also covered. I thought actually the the um, you know the data processing and and handling pipeline was really quite interesting because. You know, when you do acquire a large data set, um, if you have something that's, you know, not of interest or even just, you know, blank space, that takes up the same amount of data as, you know, informative information. Um, and so being able to kind of trim that back and just keep what's interesting for you and useful for you is very helpful. So, um, yeah, it'd be great to see that work coming into Napari where perhaps, you know, everybody could access that or, you know, deploy it locally. Yeah, that it's been really essential. Um, in particular, you know, when we started generating lattice light sheet data, um, it became quickly um, obvious that we wouldn't be able to work effectively on that data without um, trying to downsample it somehow or just crop it down. Uh, so um, yeah, so they've introduced this sort of more automated analysis pipeline that enables the user to define an ROI, I think, on the maximum intensity projection, which is easier to open and work with, and then from there, um, crop the three-dimensional data set in time, um, which means that then we can, and we can also crop it also in time and then import it into a Maris and, and the data becomes a lot easier to work with. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good note to finish up on. Um, so thank you so much for the fantastic talk, Kelly, and um, yeah, good luck with all of your work. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Okay, you're welcome. All right.